I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 29. This evening we'll cover two chapters, chapters 29 and chapter 30. It is a lengthy reading, but one that should have enough to keep our attention as we hear the Word of God read and proclaim this evening. So let us give our attention to God's Word. 1 Samuel chapter 29. Now the Philistines had gathered all their forces at Ephek, and the Israelites were encamped by the spring that is in Jezreel. As the lords of the Philistines were passing on by hundreds and by thousands, and David and his men were passing on in the rear with Achish, the commanders of the Philistines said, What are these Hebrews doing here? And Achish said to the commanders of the Philistines, Is this not David, the servant of Saul, king of Israel, who has been with me now for days and years? And since, he has, he, he, and since he deserted to me, I have found no fault in him to this day. But the commanders of the Philistines were angry with him. And the commanders of the Philistines said to him, Send the man back, that he may return to the place to which you have assigned him. He shall not go down with us to, the, to battle, lest in the battle he become an adversary to us. For how could this fellow reconcile himself to his Lord? Would it not be with the heads of the men here? Is not this David of whom they sing to one another in dances? Saul has struck down his thousands, and David his ten thousands. Then Achish called David and said to him, As the Lord lives, you have been honest. And to me it seems right that you should march out and in with me in the campaign. For I have found nothing wrong in you from the day of your coming to me to this day. Nevertheless, the lords do not approve of you. So go back now. And go peaceably, that you may not displease the Lord to the Philistines. And David said to Achish, But what have I done? What have you found in your servant from the day I entered your service until now, that I may not go and fight against the enemies of my Lord the King? And Achish answered David and said, I know that you are as blameless in my sight as an angel of God. Nevertheless, the commanders of the Philistines have said, He shall not go up with us to the battle. Now then, rise early in the morning with the servants of your Lord who came with you, and start early in the morning and depart as soon as you have liked. So David set out with his men early in the morning to return to the land of the Philistines. But the Philistines went up to Jezreel. Now when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day, the Amalekites had made a raid against the Negev and against Ziklag. They had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire and taken captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great. They killed no one, but carried them off and went their way. When David and his men came to the city, they found it burned with fire, and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. And David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. David's two wives also had been taken captive, Hinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters. But David strengthened himself, and the Lord has gone. And David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, Bring me the ephod. So Abiathar brought the ephod to David. And David inquired of the Lord, Shall I pursue after this band? Shall I overtake them? He answered him, Pursue. For you shall surely overtake, and shall surely rescue. So David sent, set out, and the six hundred men who were with him, and they came to the brook Bezor, where those who were left behind stayed. But David pursued, he and four hundred men. Two hundred stayed behind, who were too exhausted to cross the brook Bezor. They found an Egyptian in the open country, and brought him to David. And they gave him bread, and he ate. And they gave him water to drink, and they gave him a piece of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit revived, for he had not eaten bread or drunk water for three days and three nights. And David said to him, To whom do you belong, and where are you from? He said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite, and my master left me behind because I fell sick three days ago. We had made a raid against the Negev of the Cherethites, and against that which belongs to Judah, and against the Negev of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. And David said to him, Will you take me down to this band? And he said, Swear to me by God that you will not kill me, or deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will take you down to this band. And when he had taken him down, behold, 
They were spread abroad over all the land, eating and drinking and dancing, because of all the great spoil they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. And David struck them down from twilight until the evening of the next day. And not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who mounted camels and fled. David recovered all that the Amalekites had taken, and David rescued his two wives. Nothing was missing, whether small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything that had been taken. David brought back all. David also captured all the flocks and herds, and the people drove the livestock before him and said, This is David's spoil. Then David came to the two hundred men who had been too exhausted to follow David and who had been left at the brook Bezor. And they went out to meet David and to, and to meet the people who were with him. And when David came near to the people, he greeted them. And all the wicked and worthless fellows among the men who had gone with David said, Because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except that each man may lead away his wife and children and depart. But David said, You shall not do so, my brothers, with what the Lord has given us. He has preserved us and given into our hand the band that came against us. Who would listen to you in this matter? For as his share is who goes down into the battle, so shall his share be who stays by the baggage. They shall share alike. And he made it a statute and a rule for Israel from that day forward to this day. When David came to Ziklag, he sent part of the spoil to his friends, the elders of Judah, saying, Here is a present for you from the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. It was for those in Bethel, in Hermoth, in the Negev, in Jatir, in Eroer, in Sifmoth, in Eshtemoah, in Rakal, in the cities of the Jeremielites, in the cities of the Kenites, in Hormah, in Bor Ashon, in Abak, in Hebron, for all the places where David and his men had roamed. The grass withers, and the flower fades. The word of our God will stand forever. Beloved congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, we've been working together through this book, seeking to understand what it is that we are taught here, seeking to see precisely what David is teaching what God is teaching us through David's actions. Indeed, the ways in which David has grown and his understanding of all that God has taught him. It comes together here in this chapter, even as we wait for the time when David will be made king over Israel. We're coming to the end of 1 Samuel. Remember that this is a book that is a tale of two kings. Saul was the king that they demanded, the king they wanted. That was when they rejected the Lord. Saul's meteoric rise in this book was followed by a spectacular failure and a long, slow burnout as king. Much like the story of Ruth, all that takes place in Saul's life is to bring us to meet, to understand, even to identify with David. He is the man after God's own heart. We have studied these chapters together, watching him grow as well as stumble from time to time. Indeed, we're reminded of what Solomon will say in Proverbs 24 and verse 16. For the righteous man falls seven times and rises again. The wicked stumble in times of calamity. And that could be a clear way to understand the life of David and the life of Saul. Saul is the one who stumbles in the times of calamity. David is the one, though he stumbles, he falls. Or though, though, though he stumbles, he rises again. As we've been working our way through this book, then we've been at kind of an awkward place. David, uh, it's sort of been building to this. It really is building to chapter 31 in the battle where Saul will die. But along the way, David has, uh, 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 has positioned himself in an awkward situation. He has put himself there with the Philistine king, Achish. He has placed himself in a place where he might be put, might be required to make a decision that he doesn't want to make. As we left him last time in chapter 27, but remember last week we looked together, or the week before that, we looked together at Saul, the witch of Endor. Saul has always been afraid of David. He was afraid of what might happen, but he adds a level of de desperation that we hadn't seen before. We're used to him exhausting all human means to manipulate his circumstances. But in our last chapter together, he turned to the dead. He did what was explicitly forbidden by going to a medium and seeking contact with Samuel. Much to the surprise of everyone, including the witch, Samuel appeared. There Saul had his last night, his last meal, and the word from Samuel left him paralyzed with fear. Our story tonight backtracks to right after chapter 28 and verse 1. 
where we read that in those days the Philistines gathered their forces for war to fight against Israel. This is what we've been waiting for. How will this conflict be resolved? How will David not be put in a place where he will have to fight against his own people? We're taking chapters 29 and 30 together because I believe they're dealing with the same issue. Providentially, even against David's own professed desires, he will be removed from the situation entirely. He is removed from battle, whether on the side of Israel or on the side of the Philistines. These chapters examine then David's loyalties. They show us where his strength comes from. It reminds us of God's gracious providence as we also are led by the same shepherd Lord who gave David strength, who guided him through his life. Before we turn to look at our text together, let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time we have to consider it tonight. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would give us attentive ears as your word is proclaimed as we reflect together upon how David points us forward to his greater son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. For David indeed would be king over Israel, but Christ is the king over the Israel of God. Indeed, he is, he is king over all of creation, and we rejoice that he is our king, gracious, merciful, and generous, even as we see David in these chapters tonight. So help us to see how much greater, how much more merciful, and how much more generous our Savior is. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's look together at our text this evening to see how this unfolds. Since we're taking two chapters together, we'll move a bit quicker than we usually do. But it begins with this difficulty. And the difficulty isn't hard to understand. We are told that the Philistines have gathered there at effect. We are told that the Israelites are also there in Jezreel. Again, there's a, a kind of military parade going on. If you will, the lords of the Philistines have gathered in order to see all of their armies, the five kings over the Philistines, gathered there together. And they're bringing by their people in hundreds and in thousands. And there in the rear, there at the very end, in the back with Achish, is David and his men. And you might think that he would get, get away with this. I mean, after all, how would you pick out this band of men from all the thousands that are present? But clearly there is something about David and his men that he's picked up on immediately. The lords of the Philistines see that this is David. They see the problem, even though Achish can't. It's a bit of irony that Achish will say in our text tonight that David has been honest with him. We know that David hasn't been honest with him. We examined that a, a few weeks ago. We saw how David had deceived Achish. So good was, it, was his deception then that Achish will even go to bat for him, even argue against the lords of the Philistines. It is true, though, that our text is about David. He is being tested. If he quit the, 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 the army, with, uh, uh, quit the, the battle of being with the Philistines to fight with Israel, he would be found out. He would make a great enemy with Achish. He would be put back under the attack of Saul. After all, that's the reason for his deception. That's the reason why he has gone over to the Philistine land. was to avoid Saul. Things had gotten that bad. But he fought with the Philistines who would betray his people and bring into question his right to be king. If Saul is killed, and we learn, of course, that that is going to happen. If he's killed in the battle, then the fault could very well be laid on David as if he had killed him. But David will not grasp at the kingdom. But if he simply walked away, he would be branded a coward by his own men, who had grown considerably since that first group of 300 had come out. We read about this in 1 Chronicles 12, verses 16 to 19, that there are many more that come out to David, even while he's there in the land of the Philistines. Some of the men of, the, of Manasseh deserted from Saul to David. And so, here David is being tested. And we see, of course, the concern. The commanders of the Philistines see them and say, what are these Hebrews doing here? Achish, for his part, goes to that. And you might wonder, what exactly is the concern? Now, the lords of the Philistines seem to understand that possibly David and his men might defect and go and, and bring the heads of the people, the heads of the Philistines, to Saul as, as, as a tribute. If you remember all the way back in 1 Samuel chapter 14, we read there about Saul and one of his battles uh, with the Philistines. And we read there in verse 21 that the Hebrews who had been with the Philistines, they left and they turned to be with the Israelites. 
who was Saul and Jonathan. So the lords of the Philistines are reflecting on something that had actually already happened. There was a time that they went into battle against Saul and against the Israelites, and those who were with him turned against them. So they think that David might do the same. Achish, for his part, he thinks he's defending David. Is this not David, the servant of Saul, king of Israel? And of course their response is, yes, it's David. That's the problem. Saul has struck down his thousands. David is ten thousands. So Achish is pressed. He comes, of course, and he goes to David and he says, as the Lord lives, but notice that they use that all capital L-O-R-D. They're speaking the name of Yahweh. You've been honest to me. It seems right that you should march in and out, or out and in with me in the campaign, for I have found nothing wrong with you from the day of your coming to me to this day. Nevertheless, the lords do not approve of you. So in order to find peace with the rest of the Philistine lords, Achish sends David away. What does David do? He argues. He pushes back. What have I done? What have you found in your servant from the day I entered your service until now? that I may not go and fight against my en the enemies of my lord, the king. Now, ancient commentators looking at this see this as one of those moments where David turns to the camera and winks. My lord, the king. Which lord? Which king? Is he speaking of Achish? Is he speaking of Saul? Is he saying here that he's going to, he's going to go out and do everything he can to slaughter Israelites and defend Achish? Or is he truly saying what the lords of the Philistines are afraid of? that he will put himself even in harm's way to defend Saul. Remember, back in chapter 28 and verse 2, David said to Achish, you shall know what your servant can do. Again, it's somewhat of a cryptic message. It's not that kind of straightforward thing where David is saying, I would have died for you. I would have laid down my life. And so most older commentators believe that David was making a vow to not allow harm to befall Saul. That might strike us as a bit odd, but this goes in line with David's character of what we've seen so far. David has refused to put out his hand and strike Saul. So it makes sense that he would also put himself in a place where he might be able to defend Saul, even as he has run away from him. Well, as we've seen throughout David's life, God has provided for him. God has providentially led, and God's sovereignty has saved him time after time after time. And so we're not surprised that God's sovereignty removes David from the difficult situation. David set out with his men in the morning to return to the land of the Philistines. The Philistines went up to Jezreel. It's over. There's nothing more that David can do. David has been put out of the place. What well, one wonders. Will he be satisfied with staying away from the battle? This is where we see David's situation is difficult, but it goes from bad the worse. We're reminded of the prophet, I, prophet Amos chapter 5 where he says, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light. As if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him or went into the house and leaned his hand against the wall and a serpent bit him. David has escaped, if you will, one difficult situation. But he finds himself immediately in another. We're told in the opening verses of chapter 30 that, some, that, that, that the Amalekites had come and they had raided the camp at Ziklag. The entire town had been sacked and all of the women and all of the children had been taken away. And here David and his men come upon the camp, come into the city, and they see everything that has taken place. And here these hardened warrior men, ready to go out with King Achish, ready to fight the battle, they weep so they had no more strength to weep. This is a way of saying that they simply wept and wept and wept. And if you've ever had moments of sorrow where you've wept so much that you've fallen asleep, it's that kind of weeping. And you might notice there in the opening verses of chapter 30 that we are told that the women have been taken, the wives have been taken, and then in verse 5 it repeats that David's two wives also have been taken captive. As though to remind us that David was not exempted from the sufferings of his people, even as God was providentially and sovereignly guiding his path. Well, David, as I said, moves from a situation that is bad to one that is worse. Of course, it's bad to be stuck in the battle and to have to decide between the Israelites and the Philistines. 
Although I can't help but think that David had a plan in mind even at that time. But here he comes to a situation where he has no plan. There is no way out of this. The city of Ziklag has been laid waste. And it gets worse. In verse 6 we read, David was greatly distressed. For the people spoke of stoning him. Because they were all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters. David's men threatened to kill him. Threatened mutiny. To overtake him. They might be thinking something along these lines. We wouldn't be in this situation were it not for David. Surely there were other places we could have gone. But also notice who sacked Ziklag. It was the Amalekites. These are among the peoples that David and his men had quietly and slowly been raiding. Perhaps it's merely a case of revenge. Whatever the case, David is in dire straits. The people are bitter in soul, and they want to stone David. Here we're reminded of all the times in which God's people have turned upon those whom God had appointed to lead them, particularly Moses in the Old Testament. We read there in verse 6 something very important. David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. You see, this section under the loyalty, David's loyalty and the Lord, it's another test for David. Yes, the previous test was whether or not he would go out into the battle and God has removed him from that. But here is another test. Here is a more bitter test. Where will David go when all has been taken away? To where will he turn? Will he depend upon his own cleverness, his own strength? And you know that David as a mighty warrior had much strength. David as a general of thousands undoubtedly had a cunning mind in battle. But here there's nothing he could do. His men turn on him. And to compound it, his own sorrow of losing his wives. Just as they have lost theirs. And all the children too. Remember that these chapters in Samuel are comparing the two kings. When Saul is at his wit's end, when Saul is in his most desperate moment, he turns to the witch at Endor. He turns away from the word of God. He turns away from the Lord himself. But here David strengthened himself when the Lord is gone. David drew near to the Lord. And the way in which he did it is clear. He drew near to the Lord in his word, in his promise. Now I say this for two reasons. First, the text itself, but also this idea of being strengthened in God comes up in David's own life before. 1 Samuel 23 and verse 16, we are told that Jonathan went to David and Horesh and strengthened his hand in God. And the way in which he strengthened his hand was he reminded him of God's promises grounded in God's word to David and the covenant that was between the two of them. And it seems that David here is reminded of the promises of God, of God's faithfulness and goodness. As he strengthens himself in the Lord his God, he calls for God's work. You see, that's what's going on in verses 7 and 8 of chapter 30. He said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. Remember, this is that, 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 that breast piece uh, that would have within it the urn of the thummim. Upon it would be all of the stones representing the tribes of Israel. It was not there in the temple or at that time the tabernacle, but because Abiathar had come out to David, he had brought with him the ephod. So David is able to call upon the Lord. He inquires of the Lord. He seeks a word from God. Shall I pursue after this band? Shall I overtake them? And he answered them, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake, and shall surely rescue. Now remember, of course, we know that Saul did call out to the Lord, but God was silent. God did not answer. One wonders what David would have done had God not answered him. Again, I think it goes back to the fact that he strengthened himself when the Lord is God. David did not rely upon his own abilities. David did not rely upon that which was within himself but cast himself completely upon God's mercy. This is again a sharp distinction between David and Saul. During a time of great distress, both men sought supernatural guidance for battle. 
Indeed, chronologically, were we to line up the chapters, they probably were seeking the guidance on the very same day. However, Saul, in doing so, defied God's word. David receives a gracious provision. Saul sought help from the medium and received the promise of death. David sought help through the Aaronic priest using the ether to receive the promise of life and blessing. And so he's told to go. He's told that he will indeed attack the Amalekites. He will strike them and he will in fact bring back all of the wives and all of the sons and daughters. And so here we see that David mobilizes his men and he attacks the Amalekites. Now it begins there in verses 9 and 10 that he sets out 600 men with him. They come to that brook Bezor and they leave 200 men behind. 200 men were, were, were tired. 200 men stayed with the baggage to watch over it while the 400 men crossed over the brook Bezor. And they come upon a single man. Providentially there in their path is an Egyptian, a slave who had been left behind by the Amalekites. And they inquire of him, to whom do you belong? Where are you from? Well, this man, of course, must be exhausted at the point of death because you don't normally share those kinds of things with strangers that are going by, particularly in this situation. For undoubtedly anyone chasing hot on the trail of the Amalekites was going after them to, to, to bring back what had been taken. But the Egyptian man is there, ready to die. And so he simply says, says the truth. Servant to an Amalekite. My last master left me because I fell sick three days ago. But this is not a stroke of luck. This is God's providence in the matter. God is providing everything for David. And notice what he is doing. He is leading him further and further away from the battle. As though to ensure that when that arrow strikes Saul, no one can say, maybe it came from David's bow. Maybe it was David's fault. As much as David himself would have wanted to be there to defend Saul in any way that he could, David is being led further and further away, even through this difficult providence. Go back to our story. David asks him if he can take him to uh, uh, the camp. Can you take me down to this band? And the man responds, Swear to me by God that you will not kill me or deliver me into the hands of my master. And I will take you down to this band. And so he takes him down. And what do they see? They look down and they see all of the Amalekites partying. They see them just re rejoicing in all of the spoil they've taken, not just from Ziklag, but from all of the other places. And so David sees it. We read that he comes down and they destroy the Amalekites. They strike them until everyone except the 400 Amalekites escape. 400 men with David, 400 Amalekites escape, ensuring, of course, they will continue to be a thorn in the side of Israel. But for David's part, he recovers everything that the Amalekites had taken. He rescues his wives. Nothing was missing, whether great or whether small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything that had been taken. David brought back all. God's providence had not only led David further and further away from the battle, but had led him even to restore to the restoration of all that had been taken. The restoration of their sons and daughters of their wives. Everything was brought back. So we see David's loyalty. His loyalty as it was tested there among the Philistines. His loyalty as it's tested whether or not he will trust in the Lord. He strengthens himself in the Lord, his God. But now we have another test of loyalty. And one that we can probably understand a bit more. It has to do with the plunder. It has to do with everything that they had just recovered. And not just that they had recovered, because they, they, they had sacked all the various places. And so they bring back everything. Driving the flocks before them. Undoubtedly coming laden with silver and gold and all that you would bring back from a battle. We read that David came to the 200 men who had been too exhausted to follow, who had been left with Brook Bezor, and they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with him. When David came near to the people, he greeted them. 
of the Hebrews actually a bit more descriptive here. It says that David drew near to the people and he inquired of their peace. He inquired of their shalom. He was concerned about them because they needed to stay behind. You see, David's concern and love and kindness comes out here. But this stands against the response of the others. You see, David shows his compassion and his care, inquiring about their peace. But then there we read in verses 22 24 that all the wicked and worthless fellows among the men who had gone out with David said, Because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except that each man may lead away his wife and children and depart. As I said, this is a test of loyalty that we can probably understand a bit more. Surely we find ourselves maybe even just a little bit kind of agreeing with these men. And don't get me wrong, they're wicked and worthless fellows and we're meant to understand their heart and the matter as opposed to David's heart, which is going to shine through and that we are to identify with, not because we're David, but because he points us forward to a more generous and more gracious king. But they kind of have a point, don't they? Those 200 men stayed behind. Those 200 men didn't go into battle. They didn't risk their lives. They sat and watched the baggage. Why would they receive an equal share? They were there, not all the way through it, but if you will, they came in at the end. It reminds us of that parable that Jesus tells us of the kingdom of heaven. It's like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. You remember that he, he, he gets the laborers who agree for, to work for a denarius for the day. He sends them into the vineyard. He goes back at the third hour, again at the sixth hour, again at the ninth hour, and then in the eleventh hour he goes out and finds more and he brings them back in and brings them in to work. When evening came, they called the laborers to pay them their wages. And he begins with those that arrived last. He gave them a denarius. And what did those other laborers think? They thought immediately that if they receive a denarius, we'll receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. Jesus replies to them, or, or the reply comes from the master of the field, Friend, am I, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I gave to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? Back to our story, this is exactly the situation. These wicked and worthless fellows, they are begrudging David's generosity. They don't want those men who had been there for only part of the time just to the brook sitting with the baggage to receive the same amount that they themselves had received when they had gone down to the battle. But here is the key problem. It's the same problem in the parable of the vineyard. You see, those worthless fellows thought that it belonged to them. But David said, You shall not do so, my brothers, with what the Lord has given us. He has preserved us and given into our hand the band that came against us. Who would listen to you in this matter? For as his share is who goes down into the battle, so shall his share be who stays by the baggage. They shall share the light. It's not theirs. It's the Lord's. It is David who wants to be generous. He wants to be gracious and merciful, reminding us of the kind of king he's going to be. We're so close to the moment where David is going to be crowned king, that this is not a throwaway moment. This is testing David at the end of his wilderness wandering, at the end of having to be cunning and deceitful at times. What kind of king will he be to the people of God? We see that he will be a generous and merciful king. It is the Lord who had preserved them, the Lord who had given them. This, in a sense, brings together the first and the tenth commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not covet. It is God who provides for his people. And how can they respond to that provision? With jealousy. How can they respond in any other way than with mercy, with grace, and with generosity? 
here's the reality, beloved. Here, this, this, this text, it, it speaks to us as well. For we also are under a generous king. We receive what we get as Jesus has seen fit to give it to us. As we read in Ephesians chapter 4, we're reminded of Christ's goodness and faithfulness. All that He pours out upon us, the forgiveness of our sins and the gifts that He gives. We begrudge Him with His generosity. Would we cultivate that contentment that He calls us to? See, this is what David is challenging his men with, showing us first the kind of king he will be, but also pointing forward to an even greater king, Jesus Christ. Our passage ends with, our chapters end with David sending some gifts to the leaders of Judah. They are to receive a portion of the plunder as well. He says in verse 26, Here is a present for you from the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. There's more light, more here than David's kindness. He had fought the Lord's enemies as well as the enemies of the people of God. Remember the Amalekites. Remember that God said that there would be battle with Amalek from generation to generation. Moses said in Deuteronomy 25 to remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you came out of Egypt. Indeed, Saul's failure was in not blotting out the Amalekites. And so we see here David Faithful, or Saul, failed. And generous, or undoubtedly, so many other kings keep back what they believe is theirs. David therefore shows us that he is a good and faithful king, that he will be a good and faithful king, but we know that David is not a perfect king. We know that David has failed and will fail. Indeed, David will come under the wrath of God because of his failures. And his house will receive the results of his own sins. This is why David must always point us forward. He doesn't point us immediately to ourselves, but he points us to Christ. For we need one who is even greater than David. Yes, he is, he is in the very same mold of David, if you will, for he is one who identifies with his people, even as David identified in his sufferings and went through the same things that his people, that his men went through. So also our Savior identifies with us. But just as David went in his victory and gave gifts and showed generosity to his people, our Savior is greater. He identifies with us. He understands our needs. And He gives many gifts. He blesses His people in all the ways in which they need. David reminds us of the work of our Savior. The one who has pursued the enemies of Satan, sin and death and destroyed them. He has given gifts to those who are even weakest in Him. He will not crush a bruised reed. He is our shepherd Lord who is able to sympathize with our weaknesses. And so we can, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, and we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need.